So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on the changing face of choirs as we adapt to COVID-19. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, please be aware that this, uh, this webinar is being broadcast live on YouTube and um, recorded for future, uh, for prosperity, uh, what's the word? Um, posterity uh, and prosperity, hopefully. Um, questions are open on both the uh, internal chat in the Zoom room and also on YouTube. Uh, Amy, my co-host, uh, is going to try and help me monitor those questions. So please do ask. Um, there are currently two people watching on YouTube, uh, but we're expecting, as this as this meeting has been uh, proved incredibly popular, we're expecting that to increase. Uh, we have well over 70 people in the room. So um, if you do have questions, then please ask them on chat. And as I say, we'll, we'll try and monitor and um, we will try and get around to as many questions as possible. Um, Amy, did you have any other housekeeping to mention? No, I think we just need to crack on. I'll talk to everyone at the end and I will keep an eye on the live chat um, and hope to bring people in later. Fantastic, thank you. So um, uh, as we all know, uh, we are under a very particular set of uh, uh, circumstances at the moment. Um, the, the lockdowns and uh, the restrictions on movement and so forth and meeting are gradually being reduced and um, there is a possible light at the end of the tunnel for, for uh, we who have been trying to run rehearsals through um, audio conferencing software, which it clearly wasn't designed to support. Um, nevertheless, that light, as we may hear in a moment, is far from um, the, the, broad, the, the, the sunny uplands. Um, we may be finding fairly soon that um, the restrictions are more severe uh, than we were, had hoped for. Um, so we're going to talk today about the possible ways forward, uh, about some of the science that's going on, some of the research that's going on to work out uh, what we can and can't do uh, and what we can and can't advise. And uh, we're going to then talk to our illustrious panel about some of the things that we can do to make the best of this difficult situation and the situation as we as things evolve. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, first of all, let me introduce, um, let me introduce Esmeralda. Esmeralda is a colleague of mine, a, co a choral conductor and um, primarily a composer. And um, I know she's been doing some fascinating things uh, under the current situation uh, because I'm, my wife is in her choir and I hear her downstairs while I'm uh, banished upstairs. <laughs> Esmeralda, hello. Good, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. <laughs> yeah, finding finding the current situation stressful. Stressful and um, at the same time inspiring, though. It's uh, I try to find the the right balance. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, from uh, Oxford University Press, we have the uh, director of music publishing, Ben Selby, uh, who is no doubt worrying about lots of his composers at the moment. How are things going, Ben? How are your composers faring? I think um, our composers are faring pretty well, actually. Some of them are, um, some of them are actually quite enjoying the, the lockdown and a period of uh, a, a time free to be able to write. Um, one of the kind of, I think, paradoxes of being a successful composer is that ability to be able to lock down and, and write, but similarly be able to be a kind of self-publicist. Um, I think some, some are quite enjoying the, the time to be able to kind of just work on, the, on their art and, and, and writing. Um, and in the meantime, we're kind of dealing with the logistics of getting music around the world, which I'll come back to in a bit. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. I think the, the world is divided between people who have found themselves with far more time than they used to have and people who are uh, incredibly busy. Um, there doesn't seem to be much, uh, much in the middle. Uh, Daniel Spreadbury um, has, uh, I've known him for many years uh, through various different uh, software companies, uh, but he's now the, uh, the product uh, marketing manager for Dorico, uh, working uh, for Steinberg. Hi Daniel, how's things going? How are you Good morning. finding your lockdown situation? 
Yes, well, we're we're actually very lucky at Steinberg in that, um, you know, actually those of us who work in London on, on Dorico, we're sort of a remote team anyway. So uh, we're now just a bit more remote rather than being in a, in a remote office in London. We're now in our remote homes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think overall, uh, very fortunate to work in a technology company that um, that is able to to work in these times. And uh, And we've also been doing, you know, whatever we can to help support musicians who are obviously having having a very rough time at the moment with all of their performance opportunities and everything else taken away um so you know yeah but for me personally i i'm very fortunate um and uh you know no no complaints really apart from uh, homeschooling <laughs> <laughs> and uh thank you daniel and finally um my illustrious colleague uh another trustee of abcd um, and he's also the uh, editor-in-chief of our recently launched uh, choral um, singing research, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Journal. Journal, thank you. I knew it being on with a J. Um, you've been, uh, you've had a fairly relaxed few weeks, Martin, is that right? No, it is absolutely not right. I have, I can't remember the last time I was this busy. It is manic. <laughs> So um, we are going to start today um, by um, asking, I think, some of the questions that many people out there have been wanting to ask and wanting to find answers for, for uh, ever since this all started. Um, whether we can provide the answers that you're looking for remains to be seen. Um, but uh, Martin, uh, I mean, broadly speaking, the reason you've been so busy is you've been conducting, I understand, a, a, a literature review. Uh, for, um, uh, well, tell us about the, the research question that you've been engaged in. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about the research. It, it's more than a literature review. Um, <clears throat> as with any research study, you start off with a literature review to find out what everybody already knows. Then you move on to the question that's new that you want to answer. And um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll be talking brief, as brief as I can about both of those things. I, I have actually um, <clears throat> made um, a, a video uh, of what I was going to say this morning under more relaxed circumstances, which will be available to you. Uh, so you just only take frantic notes. Now, let's begin with the literature review. Um, <clears throat> now, it's stunning, the volume of scientific papers that are out there. There are thousands of them. And everybody's frantically trying to read them. And everybody who is doing that is reaching basically the same conclusion, which is our, our starting point. Choral singing is a high risk activity. Um, now, there's no getting away from that. And if I didn't say that, I would be misrepresenting the situation. Um, however, and this is what I want to concentrate on a bit more it is the new stuff. Now I am working in collaboration with Thomas Kaplan at the moment, um, who is a professor in Norway, professor of choral singing and stuff. And Norway is the country that has started to come out of lockdown in, in choral singing. Um, so we're looking at what we can learn from Norway and we're looking at what other people will need to learn as other countries start to ten tentatively to come out of the lockdown. So having said that we are in a high risk area, we are going to look at how it could get better. Um, and it is very important, I think, to give people hope for the future. But let's just say a little bit about high risk. Um, you know, people are saying, well, what's it all about? You jump in your car and you, you might crash and be killed. Now that is true, uh, but I've looked at the comparative data and at the moment, during lockdown, you are more likely to be killed by the COVID virus than you are in normal times driving down the M6. Um, so it's not true that this thing is exaggerated, it isn't. Um, <clears throat> But I think the really interesting comparison to make, where I might just quickly throw some data out, is between Norway and Sweden. Now, both very similar Scandinavian countries. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me just look at the data I have in front of me here. 
Um, road deaths in Norway per million people, uh, 21. Road deaths in Sweden per million people, 22. And the comparable figure for the UK is 31. So we're all fairly close together on that. Uh, but now look at COVID deaths. 44 per million in Norway, 419 per million in Sweden, 597 per million in the UK. Uh, so we are, as I think people know, a high risk country. Why is Sweden so different to Norway? Well, the answer is Norway have controlled their pandemic with pretty strict regulations from the outset. Sweden have adopted a laissez-faire, um, liberal approach, and the result is, let's just repeat the figures, 44 per million in Norway, 419 per million Sweden, 597 per million in the UK. Um, so that is the sort of perspective for the risk. And I think uh, the message that is hopefully going to come through this morning is that choirs will be able to restart, but only after a rigorous process of risk assessment. So I wanted to say a little bit about the risk assessment process. Uh, what are the risks we should control for? Now, the first thing is they're the same as for everybody else. So if you've been to your supermarket and you've seen the spacing on the floor and you've stood in the queue two metres apart, you've been around a one-way system, uh, well, if you're a church choir, imagine doing that in church. You know, the procession comes in, there's two metres spacing, you go around the aisles, you, you, you get the, the idea. Um, all the other measures, the risk assessments that people are doing to reopen offices, warehouses, factories, schools, choirs are going to have to do all of these risk assessments. And you can find templates and examples of how to do them if you're not familiar with it on the Health and Safety Executive website. But, now here's the but, there is over and above the risk that everybody faces, if you're a railway station or a warehouse or an office, uh, the additional risk for choirs is aerosol transmission. Now, that's where the science gets a little bit less certain. I've produced for you, and uh, it will be available, um, a, a briefing, a, a one side briefing on what aerosols are and why they're relevant to singing. Uh, I'm sure lots of you know already, but they are tiny, tiny particles and thousands of them are emitted every time you use your voice loudly. And the key point that I think people have to understand, and there's been some controversy in the science because there have been some studies that don't seem to take account of this. Your two metre social distancing rule assumes that big particles, that's more than five microns in diameter, will fall to the ground after at the most two meters. Now the thing about an aerosol particle is it's tiny and it floats around in the air and if you're in an enclosed space like a church or a concert hall, you're going to fill that enclosed space with these minuscule aerosols. And that's why, I mean, I, I saw a post this morning, you know, why can football start and choirs can't? Well, one answer to that is football is played outside. If you are in an enclosed church or concert hall, you're filling it up with aerosols. Now, scientists aren't totally agreed yet about even whether these aerosols are effective carriers of the virus, let alone how they behave when they float down the nave of your cathedral. Um, but as with all things in science, we have to take the precautionary principle. They are undoubtedly a risk we've got to take account of. Um, so I'm sure there'll be questions about aerosols. Um, the other thing is risk is variable. Now we've already said it's much, much, much higher in England than it is in Norway. So we can't just look at what they're doing in Trondheim and do it tomorrow in London. We can't do that. 
Uh, but we can say when we in the UK are on a par with Norway in terms of the general risk of the population, then our choirs can start copying theirs. But of course, the other thing is that it's different for different social groups. Uh, and I think most of you, I'm sure, will know that the high risk group is the over 70s, uh, the older you get, the greater the risk. And conversely, we're thinking children can go back to school because children are the lowest risk group. Of course, there is the risk that if a child is in your choir and they contract the virus, they could go home bouncy and happy because they're asymptomatic carriers, they can feel great, but they can give it to their granddad. And now again, the science isn't totally agreed on that, but it is a known risk. Um, however, my interpretation of this is that if you have a professional choir and the top line are children, so obviously we might be talking about a cathedral choir here, you're perhaps in a stronger position to do your risk assessment, manage your risks than a choir that's an amateur choir that, that has got older people. So maybe, maybe that kind of choir might lead the way, as they have done in Norway. Now, some of you may have seen the videos I've been posting of the, uh, the Trondheim choir, where it's very, very clear that they've reduced the number of singers. In fact, that the, the last Sunday service they had a maximum of 50 people allowed in the cathedral, maximum of 15 allowed to sing from the choir, very clearly spaced at least two meters apart. And that is Norway, where they have got 44 deaths per million compared with England, which is over 500 per million. So let's keep these things in perspective. Let's not lose hope. Um, let's move, I'm gonna nearly at my conclusion point here. Um, <clears throat> you know, this business people talk about as a new normal. I think most of us understand that COVID is here to stay. It's not gonna go away. It's going to become one of the many different kinds of coronavirus that are circulating round about. It may vary seasonally. Uh, it might get worse in the winter than the summer. Um, it might vary regionally. There might be an outbreak in York, but not in Exeter. Um, <clears throat> and these will have to be managed locally. Um, but at the end of the day, it's gonna become part of the way of life. Yes, there will probably be vaccines. There may eventually be herd immunity, uh, but I think, the what we learn about how our choirs can sing spaced out uh, in ventilated buildings all that sort of stuff is going to be with us for quite a long time to come and i did want to finish with something positive um <clears throat> that actually you know choirs don't necessarily have to line up and form out the way they always have done maybe it's actually quite good to sing a bit further spaced apart because then if you're one of these naughty singers that's micro beat behind everybody else to listen to what the bloke next to you is doing uh, you can't do that anymore you've got to know your own part you've got to count and come in exactly on time um so there, there could be some positive stuff here um so you know let's let's be positive within the risks that we're operating I think that's basically it. I, Mark's probably going to give me a grilling and maybe questions will come in. <laughs> but that's what I'm, that's my opening pitch. That's great, Martin. I mean, um, a couple of thoughts have got. I mean, we're talking about risk. And I think, you know, maybe there's a kind of element to which, uh, degree to which there's a, um, a popular understanding of that. But we're, we're really talking about the numbers here, aren't we? We're really talking about relative likelihood of, of different events uh yes we are and actually at this point i'm going to show you that you may think this is completely bizarre but if you know me you won't be surprised and look this this uh, can you all see this this is my network rail um, high visibility vest now i'm actually very proud of this because it's i'm working for network rail at the moment and the reason i'm putting this on is because the process of putting it on, quite simply, and I looked at the stats of this, 
The process of putting this on reduces the risk to me of being killed on the railway line from something like the COVID risk in Sweden to something like the COVID risk in Norway. Um, now, if you're going to say, I'm going to take my chance, it's, you know, a 500 against a million chance I'm going to die. Is that an acceptable risk? Well, Network Rail say it isn't. And if you go back to the 1960s, 600 people per year were killed, just track workers alone. Uh, if you look at Network Rail stats now, we're down to most years it's zero. And last year was really tragic because it was two. Um, so, it is a subjective thing how you treat these numbers, but you, you just got to think, how are you going to feel if um, a child in my choir goes home and affects their grandma, you know, and I'm, that's why ABCD can't tell you, you can start your choir tomorrow. What we can say is do the best and most robust risk assessment you can and the re this is again comes from the railways because I work quite a lot with the Office of Road and Rail and the Chief Inspector for Railways says time and time again paperwork 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 if you have done a proper well documented well informed risk assessment and you can show it you've acted as reasonably as you can so that's the answer really I mean, I think in many ways we've got to the point in society, uh, certainly in in countries like the UK, where we we kind of feel, on one level, we've eliminated risk, and and obviously that's a false perception. It is. Uh, you know, we 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 sort of feel that there is no no real daily risk of of our normal activities, and actually every everything you do from going out of the house in the morning to actually staying in the house uh, and you know not exercising enough there's a there's a kind of tangible and an often often measurable degree of risk isn't there but it is and of course um you know if you're over 18 uh, you assess the risk for yourself and people are not stupid mm -hmm. so if you're a conductor and you say Here's the risk of you coming back to choir. It's your decision. Um, if uh, you know children going back to school, they're not compelled to go at the moment. The parents assess the risk. Uh, we have that level of freedom. Um, one other thing I actually didn't say about the Norway research um, <clears throat> that Thomas is doing, which I hope to replicate here. Hint, hint. Please join in it. Um, <clears throat> he's actually looking at what happens. Now the problem is with things like this Skagit um, in, in the United States and the terrible outcomes of the St. John Passion in Amsterdam, which you probably all know about, the issue there was that those events happened just before lockdown. So although many, many people were affected and the outcomes were disastrous, we, you know, speaking with science, we don't know whether that was because they were hugging each other, spitting, oh, no, that's a bit unpleasant, <laughs> having accidents over each other's biscuits, you know. Um, until choirs are singing again, and we can say, this choir is singing under very carefully controlled conditions. Um, this is the area of the building. These are how far apart from the singers are. Uh, they've got no music stands, uh, they've washed their hands, they've done all the things you'd expect, and you've controlled for all of those confounding features. You can then say, has anybody caught it? And at the moment, I believe, unless Thomas emails me to say, no, it's changed, nobody's got it in Norway yet. And interesting, I didn't mention Sweden. There is a boys choir in Sweden, uh, in Stockholm, that has not stopped singing. And you cannot please extrapolate from a sample of one. But what I heard last week is that none of the boys in that choir has caught it. Um, what we can't do is say, oh, that's great, so everybody can do it. What we can and must do is say, we've got to look at these examples, get the data and know more about it. Um, would you mind if I jump in, uh, Mark and Martin? Uh, just yeah, wanted to a share couple of questions on there. Yeah, a couple of questions on the chat. Uh, Mark, do you want to field those? Uh, 
that's okay. You read, read okay. the one that you were going to. Um, so Ian Bounds has said, have you looked at how to change the choir uh, behavior so that people with mild symptoms stay away? So is this something perhaps that um, choirs need to introduce as their own specific choir policy? Um, is it something we need to look at uh, through health and safety online or through a, a dedicated health and safety officer within that choir? What are your thoughts on that, uh, Martin? Uh, well, yes, yes and yes. Um, I suppose the thing that immediately comes to light is child protection, which those of us that work with children's choirs know a lot about. Um, <clears throat> there is a general consensus on what must be done. But every choir has to have a, a, child, a safeguarding officer. And if you are running a choir with children in it, and you can't show your child protection safeguarding policy, you're not doing your job. Uh, I think it'd be exactly the same for, um, you know, the, the COVID thing, that there will have to be an appointed officer who has made sure that the risk assessments have been done and communicated to the singers. And the only thing I'd add there is uh, in an ideal world, all of the choral organisations would work together and produce a common statement about this. Um, but that's in an ideal world. We're, we, you know, people are talking to each other, but we're not there. Um, Sophie Cox has said that, can you help us to devise a risk assessment framework um, with options for measures to mitigate risk, likelihood plus consequences matrix, just as in other industries? Absolutely, very good question. Um, now, as I already said, the starting point is look at the risk assessment for uh, a school or a supermarket, because it's going to be largely the same. Um, but then you've got to add to that, uh, that you've taken account of working in an indoor space um, with the possibility of aerosol transmission. Um, what would the control measures for that be? Well, an obvious one is um, if you're a church choir, have all of your practices in the main part of the church, in the, the, not even in the choir stalls, but where you've got the most space don't rehearse in your normal um, stuffy little practice room. Now if you say that is a risk assessment to take account of aerosol transmission and uh, we have the doors open and we have a break every um, 40 minutes to let the air circulate, I, I can't say I'm not a legal expert on risk assessment but, but that would seem to me reasonable uh, control measures, that kind of thing. I, th I think um, Sue makes the point um, about uh, that the, there's being there's a certain responsibility for the uh, owners of the venue. You know, many of us rehearse in places where there's a there's a management of of the church hall or whatever. And there's an element to which um, all participants need to take part in this, isn't there? You know, we we have uh they that they, they, they have a, a responsibility to their um the users of the premises to make sure everything's safe we have a responsibility to our to our choirs our choir singers have responsibilities to us and to each other to ensure that they are minimizing the risk um of, of spreading yeah mark that's absolutely spot on and i just saw a question flash up on my screen something like are we all going to have to rent barns or something well actually Yes. Uh, now, this is exactly what's happened in Norway. Um, first of all, um, uh, some of the choirs can't go back to rehearsing because the people who rent them the premises are not making those premises available because of their own protection and risk assessment. And people who have gone back to rehearsing, um, in fact, the, the, the Tron time, the boys choir, they are very, very fortunate because they rent a 300 square meter office space. The space to them in the cathedral is not adequate. And if they didn't have that 300 square meter office space, they wouldn't have been able to have performed, not even with 15 singers. So to whoever it was flashed up, are we gonna to have to perform in barns? I'm afraid the answer is how many nice farmers do you know? 
I mean, I, certainly I want to come back to um, potential strategies for dealing with rehearsing and even performing under, under likely restrictions. Um, but I mean, uh, availability of, of all of these measures is, is a real issue, isn't it? You know, we're talking about whether we can clean, people are asking about whether we can clean all of our rehearsal spaces every, you know, between halves and so forth. Uh, they're flashing up as uh, faster than I can read. But um... Not many barns in Dublin, I'm sure that's absolutely true. Um, that, that, that's the issue we face. Not many Jane barns makes... in uh, South East London either. <laughs> Jane makes an important comment about the children going back to school. Mm. Um, there obviously has been guidance about the pods and the small groups and classrooms and deep cleaning, but actually there hasn't been any guidance about singing. Uh, she said, two head teachers I've spoken to recently will have their children singing in the classroom, spaced as they will be two metres apart and 15 in a pod. Um, and do you have any comments about this with regards to aerosols, etc.? Well, the singing thing in school, um, I was talking to members of the Cathedral Organist Association about this. And one of the bizarre things is that a chorister might go back to school and be allowed to sing at school and not be allowed to sing in the cathedral. Now that's speculation because as, as the person who asked the question, you're absolutely right. I don't think there's been any guidance on whether people can sing in schools. I Now a lot of teachers will, perhaps music teachers will require singers and, and they'll be connected into this. They, they'll know this. I suppose with my cynical hat, maybe I shouldn't say this, I mean, do children sing in school at the best of times? That's a, don't forget where we're coming from here. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's another unknown, actually. Um, difficult to say. I don't know if Mark's got a view on that. And I, I just wanted to come back to one thing that we were, uh, maybe we, we touched on but didn't go into details i mean one of the aspects is that the risk increases the longer you're in a situation doesn't it so yes it uh, does you know yes. being in a i mean i think they did start saying this you know if you're if you're in contact with somebody for more than two minutes then then your your risk is elevated well we're talking about two to two and a half hours and it's clear that that's going to increase the risk well well above a sort of casual uh, passing somebody in the street isn't it Yes, and, and, and the, the unknown, and I, I think I might be answering a question that's just flashed on the screen, you know, when will we have an answer? Um, that's a hostage to fortune to say by December or something. Um, I think the earliest hint of an answer is if anything goes wrong in, in Norway, or even my contacts in Sweden, if they say, oh, some boy's granddad's now got it. Um, but it's like I say, until choirs go back and start taking the risk, you're not going to get the answer. So somebody has got to start somewhere, unfortunately. Do you know what the time frame might be, Martin, before we have a, um, a hard evidence either way about, about aerosols, aerosol transmission? Well, I think um, given that the research in Norway has been going on for several weeks, I, we'll know from them in you know, September, October, that there, there could be some provisional results coming in. I, I think we've got to get up to the position they are in Norway, uh, which is far, far less transmission in the general population. Um, so if our lockdown, you know, if people start sitting outside cafes in the sunshine and that's OK, and then maybe five people allowed, are allowed in a restaurant that normally seats 20 and that's OK, we can start saying a classroom had 10 children in it and there are normally 30 and they did some singing and that was OK. Uh, now, your guess at how long it's going to take for all of those things to happen is probably as good as mine. Um, but, I mean, the government is saying the next stage of relaxation when you might be able to sit outside a cafe is coming in July. Um, 
the question that just flashed up, is it wise for teachers to start singing with children in school? Um, <clears throat> well, I would say it would be most unwise of them to do that without including singing lessons in their risk assessment. And I would repeat what I said 10 minutes ago, paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. I'm quoting the Chief Inspector of Railways. Don't wait until you've had your accident to do your paperwork. Do it first. Mark, you're on mute. Yes, I am. I was muted. I was unmuted and then I muted myself. Uh, yeah, that, thank you, um, Martin. That's that's a fantastic overview. I mean, we've already fielded lots of questions and I'm sure they'll carry on coming in. Um, and I'm quite sure that um, if you uh, want to submit questions that you think of after the event, um, there will be some useful dialogue going on within ABCD and, and further afield. Um, just to, to keep this question live uh, in a very active way, because obviously it's it's something that we're all hanging on very much. So um, thank you to Martin for the work he's been doing over the last last few weeks and months, because I know I know he's um, uh, well. He was um, had a full head of hair and and uh, very very black and. Uh, well, I think he hasn't been black for quite a long time. <laughs> As for myself, administered haircuts. <laughs> oh, I did that yesterday, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> I, I mean, I I wanted to talk for a, a couple of minutes about some things I've been considering um, in terms of rehearsals. I mean, I think the the overriding message that I'm getting from the kind of research we're seeing is that um, the rehearsals, uh, clearly, the rehearsals we're gonna we're gonna be engaged in over the next few months and potentially years are going to change uh, and the way I see it, we have two options. We, broadly speaking, try and fit all of our choir into some space. Uh, and for many people, that's, well, if you have a small choir, that may be feasible. For, but for many larger choirs, that's just not going to happen. Um, otherwise, inevitably, we're going to start rehearsing with part of our choir in the room, um, if we're lucky, and part of our choir not. Uh, and so I think we need to, we're going to need to start reflecting on, on how that might work. Uh, and inevitably, even if even if we are um, in a situation purely of uh, of having a choir, um, a, 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 even if we have a, a, enough room to rehearse our entire choir, we're still going to have singers who are in vulnerable groups who can't who can't attend for for because they're high risk. Uh, and as you know, the the track and trace um, program has just been launched. So I think we we're going to have to accept that um, with that with very little notice, uh, some of our singers are suddenly going to be told to to isolate for four weeks. Indeed, we ourselves may be told to to isolate for four weeks. Uh, and uh, not only is there a one size fits no, no one size fits all solution. There's no there's no simple solution that we we can just uh, reproduce for every choir. But we're going to have to be uh, very agile, very adaptable um, as things change both in the science and the government guidance and our own individual situations, I think we're going to um, have to be able to react very quickly. So uh, I think the more we can do with our choirs uh, and um, my the, the, the chair of my large choral society is, is here today, I believe, and we were talking about this the other day, that, that it's, it has to be a dialogue um, between all parties to make sure that we're making the right decisions uh, for the, the right group, for the group that we're dealing with um so i mean i was just going to look at some uh some kind of options the, the the i think most of us probably are used to having sectional rehearsals um but i think um that can be extended to the concept of having smaller choirs uh working as as individual units um, the problem of course then being uh whether if you've got you know a small tenor section how do you split your tenor section among four sub choirs when there's only six of them, and so on? Uh, those all those kind of issues come to come to head. Um, so then it may be that we can do something with technology to have a, a kind of main uh, live choir in our rehearsal space, and that we have to find some way of um, broadcasting or recording those rehearsals and uh, and transmitting them. Um, out to the those who are not able to attend for whatever reason um 
I'm going to bring um, Esmeralda in here just uh, just briefly. I know I'd love I'd love to talk to you about your pieces that you're writing at the moment, but just out of interest, how is it going with rehearsing? Are you finding interesting ways of getting around uh, the rehearsal restrictions, or are you stuck as stuck as the rest of us? Well, I'm I'm a bit stuck like the rest. Um, so my rehearsals go online at the same time. Um, I have a touring piece currently, um, that's scheduled for end of August in Switzerland and their regulations just have been, um, opened up. So, uh, suddenly we have the problem. What do we do? So we're allowed to perform, but what is the safest way to do it? So, and there's an orchestra involved as well. And, as you can imagine, we have lots of meetings <laughs> discussing everything, looking at the science, but also looking at um, audiences. <laughs> will audiences enjoy it? Will they come? Will they be scared? But also, what about the health and safety of the singers? Will they enjoy standing so far away from each other? Can we hear them? Um, it's, it's a complicated chicken and egg run, I think. Uh, but, but I guess everyone's in the same shoes. It's, um, I think Switzerland has less cases than the UK, clearly. Otherwise, they wouldn't open it up that confidently. But mm. at the same time, we don't want to be initiating, <laughs> coming mm. from the UK, you know, traveling over and bringing, bringing virus over and all of these things. So we're very mindful and very worried, obviously, um, how to keep... A touring piece, a large-scale touring piece, alive. So yeah, it's. I mean, it's clearly an evolving situation. So I think you know we're going to have to monitor how things change and uh, and adapt, as I say, to our to the situation. Um, Daniel, you're a director as well. Are you still rehearsing at the moment? No, <clears throat> no, we haven't been rehearsing since um, since March. Actually, we stopped a few weeks before lockdown. Mm. Um, and I'm in a couple of church choirs as well, which also stopped before Easter, of course, as I'm sure that's everybody's experience as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's 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 been a long old time without any without any singing, apart from singing at your computer, which is really really not the same. <laughs> yeah, I, have you been engaging in in uh, virtual choirs and so forth then? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I and I think they're you know it's wonderful, of course. Um, it's still great to to sing, and it's and it's kind of wonderful that people are putting the time in to then assemble all of these. You know, twenty, thirty, however many recordings I've seen. Some that I've participated in some myself up to about twenty to thirty people. But you know, you see some online that are sixty people or six hundred people, and you just think, good grief, the um, the effort that's that's going into um, into into producing those. But I, I know for myself, you know, I find it very gratifying to to be part of a performance even if it's even if it's not a live one um just because you know it's it's such a huge part of all of our all of our lives and it's mm. it's very painful to have it sort of wrenched away as it has been over these last few months I, I mean i think it's interesting that we we see at the moment we're seeing a lot of choirs are seeing these uh, virtual choir videos as an end in themselves uh and i think it will be interesting to see moving forward whether we can Kind of incorporate those more into the rehearsal process um and uh and potentially even the performance process uh you know into performances but um i think the the biggest problem is that that you know if we want a virtual choir video to to become part of a performance then the feedback is is a very very slow process you know it, it takes realistically speaking we can only assemble those things over the the, the course of days and weeks so it's not like we can um, use it in that rehearsal then and there. And have, have you, uh, I, I know you're in um, technology, with your technology hat on, your company has some solutions for remote um, collaboration. Would you like to tell us a bit about those? Sure. So, I mean, obviously, the, the main problem that we're all experiencing when we're trying to use these sort of consumer focused video conferencing tools like Zoom, like Skype and so on, is that the latency is is basically impractical you you cannot have any kind of sense of any kind of real time feedback between conductor and performer or even between the performers themselves because everything has you know even even a quarter of a second of latency is enough to completely throw everything off so um, yes, we we've worked on some stuff at Steinberg, and there are other other available solutions as well for low latency um, monitoring and 
audio kind of transmission. Um, the one that we have is a technology called VST Connect, which you can use to basically, it's as if you can make anybody anywhere on the internet into a person on the other side of the glass in a recording studio. So your your computer becomes the, you know, the mixing desk, as it were. And then somewhere on the internet, there's a person who um, who can record and it records, you know, live as if they were actually right there. Um, and there are other technologies available. Session Wire is another one that people use with great success. But even with these things, the trouble is that they don't scale to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 uh, people all at the same time. And um, I think one of the big challenges that we have as we start to think about these kinds of mixed rehearsals where we have you know, some people perhaps in a socially distanced way in a rehearsal space and then other people online is that um, although it may well be possible for you to get your audio to them instantaneously, they can't get any audio back to you on anything like the same um, level of low latency. Plus, I don't know where you all rehearse your choirs, but um, where I rehearse my um, my sort of a cappella choir is in a school hall, fine, but it's got basically, you know, rubbish internet, no, no offense um, to the people who run that school, which is a wonderful school. We're very grateful to have a big school hall to rehearse in. And we probably could just about manage to get two meters apart in that room, although, you know, we'd worry about air circulation. Hello, cat. Um, but the but the real problem then is that anybody who isn't able to attend that rehearsal because they're you know in a vulnerable group or they're self isolating, there's really no way of them of them participating with the technology that's available to us at the moment. Um, one more thing I will mention, just because it happened literally yesterday, is that Facebook have just announced an app for um, for music making, uh, socially distanced music making called Collab. Uh, which they announced literally yesterday. Um, you can't actually use it yet, so I haven't seen it for myself. But um, again, the idea is that they are trying to make it possible to actually do it live. And, and that, I think, is very interesting. Again, it's, it's going to be dependent on having an internet connection. And I think all of these um, tools really rely on you having a, a, a home standard broadband internet connection because if you do it over, you know, if you're lucky enough to be able to do it over 4G on your mobile, then maybe... Um, you you have sufficiently low latency. 5G would be sufficiently low latency, but none of us really in, in, in general have what 5G phones and of course 5G connectivity is only available in some of our bigger cities at the moment anyway, and certainly not in the kinds of you know rural places that we might be rehearsing community choirs and, and this kind of thing. So um, so there isn't, unfortunately, although, you know, it's, it's amazing and wonderful that we have tools like Zoom and Skype and so on that allow us to at least stay connected to our choirs and to do, and also to do recordings on our phones for virtual choirs and so on. Um, unless this Facebook tool turns out to be really remarkable, mm -hmm. there isn't at the moment something that scales to the size of even a, even a smallish choir, really, that would allow us to, to mix in-person and remote people in a way that would feel as immediate and spontaneous as as an in-person rehearsal would be at the moment sadly I, I think to some extent the the point is that there's no there's never going to be a single software solution which solves all of the problems that we're trying to solve um okay. you know there are so there are other um uh for example there's this software which is used in the uh, broadcasting arena there's something called clean feed uh, which is very often used for, for things like radio interviews. So people can, can have a high quality audio, audio connection uh, and that can cope with a, a handful of users and the, the latency is, is kind of the, probably comparable to, to something like Zoom. Um, so, but you can at least mix levels and you can, uh, you can make sure that the audio quality is good. You can get stereo connections. Uh, whereas as you say, you know, 40 or 50 people in a room uh in different rooms that are probably just from a bandwidth point of view that's never going to be feasible um, and I, yes i think the other thing of course is that once we're talking about using um a mixture of in person you know a small group in a room say and then people online is that you then also have to consider that that has to be mic'd you know there's no way that you'll be able to use your phone yep. or even your laptop 
to get any kind of audio that will be representative of what's actually happening in the room to the people who are remote. It will be basically inaudible. So at that point, you're, you know, you're then also looking at additional investment in terms of hardware that you've got to have. You're going to have to have a laptop and an internet connection and at least one microphone, probably two, mm. which means you also need an audio interface, you know, and, and so on and so on. And so I, I think, unfortunately, for a lot of for a lot of choirs, that will actually put um, put that out of financial reach, even if they have the technical know-how to do it, mm. which is, you know, we're, as we are, we as choral directors now all going to have to become recording engineers as well, um, in order yep. to to include um, people remotely in our in our rehearsals. It's it's quite a challenge. Mm. I mean, I certainly think we we as ABCD and we as sort of technology specialists can, to some extent, lead um, potentially. The certainly when I started doing. Um, professional style recordings a, a few years ago and and the cost was just beginning to be uh feasible for somebody who was working on their own these days you can get a decent pair of microphones for a hundred quid and you can get a sound card which uh for, for less than that which will plug into your laptop and suddenly you've got kind of you know professional standard sound uh, but as you say you need somebody who understands it and who can um, edit it and who can uh, set levels and so forth uh, as you go and then you are um, I, I've been trying to do something with uh, some of my singing friends um, on, on YouTube I tried to set up a um, uh, sort of cooperative to, to do performances uh, the problem is that a lot of these people say, are saying can I connect from my phone and the answer is uh, much as I'd like to no you can't um, it's just not going to be feasible you need a certain level of technology uh, just to get into this market the encouraging thing I've found is that um, the surprising uh, degree to which people who you might think are perhaps, let's say, in the age bracket or demographic, uh, not to want to get involved in technology, uh, have have embraced it uh, very much. You know, people are, are really keen to, 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 to overcome these hurdles and, and get involved. Um, I, I wanted to talk to Ben now about uh, the, the rehearsal process particularly, and I, I know um, OUP and other publishers are, are, are trying to help as much as possible to uh, for, for choirs to help in learning learning resources and so forth. Um, do you want to do you want to just talk about that for a minute? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, <clears throat> we've like like the rest of the world been through um, an extraordinary two and a half months. I can't remember anything like it. Uh, and uh, I think our our initial issues were were logistical largely. Um, we're most of our most of our choral music is distributed uh, in physical form, um, so issues around printers being closed, warehouses being closed, retailers being closed, uh, freight routes being closed. Um, so the ability to move physical music around the world has been really difficult. Um, we're kind of coming out of that, thankfully. That's beginning to kind of um, ease down a little bit. Um, and now we're kind of, in a sense, more focused on how do we support choirs uh, in in accessing things um, going, going forward from this. Um, so lots of choirs working virtually, uh, or as we talked about previously in this session, um, sort of hybrid type models in the future. Um, so I mean, the first thing we've been looking at is just just actually making it easy for people who've already got print music but can't access it at the moment. Uh, so we've um, immediately relaxed our rules around copying of music, where where people have bought print copies, if they contact us, we're um, we're supplying gratis licenses for people to distribute music digitally. Uh, so that's that's happening, and uh, I'd encourage everyone who who needs to needs to be able to do that to contact publishers. And I think all all of our all of our colleagues in the publishing industry are doing similar similar things. Um, the second thing we've done is um, really kind of accelerated a program that we'd started anyway of making music available digitally. Um, that up until now, that's been a relatively small part of the, the kind of sheet music market. Um, but I suspect that will increase quite dramatically through this period. And I suspect probably mean a lot of people will get used to it through this crisis and not return to print. Uh, so we are um, accelerating pretty rapidly our the amount of music we've got available digitally. Uh, so I think we're up to about 600 titles about in, within the AUP catalogue now uh, of choral music now available for people to be able to buy online, download and print at home um, or display on the tablet. Uh, and we are now kind of accelerating that pretty dramatically. So last week we went live with a further 125 titles and we're looking at a kind of target of 100 titles a week. So we're really kind of pushing that, um, that pace. 
Um, and then the other thing is just thinking a little bit about support mechanisms for choirs that um, aren't meeting physically. Uh, so we've been working quite closely with some of the rehearsal track sites, so audio audio tracks that are providing both rehearsal tracks and accompaniment tracks. Uh, there's an American site called Choral Tracks that we've been working particularly closely with, uh, but there are a number of others in the UK as well. Um, so we're we're supporting them by providing files to kind of make to enable them to produce um, audio to support people uh, who are working in isolation. Um, and as I say, that's a kind of useful tool, regardless of this particular crisis, but particularly so where people where choirs are working remotely. Um, we've touched on the fact that there are a number of online virtual choir initiatives underway at the moment, um, and we've been supporting some of those. So um, the self isolation choir is one that's been um, has been quite successful. They've got I think nearly four thousand members. Um, they've been offering online sectionals, rehearsal, um, providing rehearsal tracks to people. Um, and I think they're, they're doing their first concert, quote concert tonight, um, they're doing a Messiah, uh, I think it's uh, tomorrow night, half past seven tomorrow night, so that's online if people want to see that. Um, they're thinking ahead now and they're operating a summer school um, and they've got a, a week of, of John Rutter music and we're providing a kind of bespoke booklet, digital booklet for them of, of, of uh, John's music. Uh, so that's, that's kind of happening. Um, and then John himself actually is looking at an initiative to support online choirs, um, which we're just kind of working with him at the moment. So I won't say too much about that now, but over the next kind of few weeks, uh, there'll be more to follow on that front as well. Um, I mean, I think, as, as Martin said, one of the things is we're kind of moving through different phases of this and we've been in a, gone from a very kind of short time window to thinking, this is now, we're now sort of looking a little bit more medium term and actually with the recognition that this isn't going to go away quickly. Um, and things might ease, but we're probably in a sort of hybrid world for some time to come. Um, and I think as we go through that, inevitably choirs are going to operate in different ways. So our role as a publisher really is just to kind of understand what's happening and and try and work out how best we support the, the market that we that we serve. So if there are things we're not doing that are helpful, then please do do come back to us and talk to us about it because we're we're all ears on that front. Thanks, Ben. I I wanted to just just ask Creek briefly about um uh, copyright and performance right issues. Um, I, I, know, I know some publishers have been quite explicit in saying, you know, you may copy these these pieces as long as you own them, you can distribute copies digitally. Uh, what about uh, what about performance? Is that is that an issue for you? Are, are online performances covered by um, uh, 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 Legal, legal, legal protections that you're kind of concerned about at the moment. Is that a concern that things are going to happen that you weren't expecting? Uh, technically, there are there are challenges to that, but most publishers and we're, AUP included are, are, as you say, being pretty relaxed about that at the moment. I mean, what we want to do is make sure that the uh, the, the choral community continues to prosper because the, ultimately, without without you, we haven't got a business. So. Um, the, the, where people are being reasonable about the things they're doing, uh, we're not we're not being difficult about that. I mean, if there are ever any questions about that, do contact us. And um, as I say, I mean, in terms of the print print music itself, we're being very relaxed about offering gratis licenses for those things. Um, but similarly, performance things. I mean, come and come and talk to us if you're in any doubt, because there is there is kind of ambiguity about all of that at the moment. Um, but I mean, our, our our starting point is how do we make it easy for people to do do things that are reasonable so we're not going to be difficult about it brilliant thank you very much um, i want to come to esmeralda in, in just a second because i know she's doing some fascinating things uh, but I, we have a lot of questions stacking up uh so i think we better just cover some of those um amy have you got, made a note I, I can scroll through but um ben was asking about uh having somebody in the choir to do mixing and so forth i mean i i think this is certainly true that that if we are going to look at technological solutions, we need to find. Uh, certainly, I found personally running a, a Zoom rehearsal and trying to manage the room and trying to make sure everybody's muted and and and, and you know I'm sure we've all had this experience is is a real um, you know it's a real mind blow at times. Uh, we uh, we do we're going to need not only to get um, sort of up to speed with the technology, but I think we're going to have to get other people in the choir to help support this. Um, there is, uh, somebody was asking on YouTube about singing outside um, uh, versus inside. Um, I mean, I think this this is gonna be an issue 
going forward, isn't it, that we um, finding spaces to sing is going to be a lot easier in the summer um, uh, when we can potentially keep the doors wide open. Um, Martin, do you have any any anything more about um, location? Um, well, people have realised that they are going to have to look at the spaces they use, mm -hmm. and that they, you know, you may need to reduce the number of singers to shrink the choir to fit the space. Um, that means you're going to have to think of a rotor of who sings and when so that, you know, you don't damage people's self-esteem. I mean, I'm a rubbish singer. If they said you're not singing next Saturday, I think, oh, they're good. you know. Um, so there is that to think about. Uh, I did want to come back. This is a related issue to who bears the risk for all this. Um, this and also, fits into a question Daniel was asking, actually. So, yes, do. do yeah. And also, there was a very good question that flashed up a, a while ago about whether aerosols are directional. So if I could address that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, to deal with the risk thing, um, <clears throat> you know, I've tried to give people hope, uh, uh, you know, that there are choirs singing in Norway. But I'm so empathised with people saying, are you asking me to do a risk assessment? Does it fall on my shoulders? Um, <clears throat> The, the thought I had about that, and I'm not a legal expert here, um, but every choir with children will have a child safeguarding officer and it will have a policy. Now, if in spite of that, a child is abused in that choir, I don't think and I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think the person who wrote and administered the child safeguarding policy is going to be in the frame for it, uh, because they have been reasonable, the choir has been reasonable. So I'm not saying this is the situation, I'm saying choral organisations like ABCD need to look at this, uh, because there is a strong case for every choir to appoint a covid officer who deals with this and it's channeled through them and you have a policy which is documented so no individual bears the risk personally it's borne by the procedures of the body of the choir now the um the um, are aerosols directional um maybe it was freudian that i didn't mention that <laughs> There is a journal called the Journal of Aerosol Science. Now, who I subscribe would, to that myself, funnily enough. Who would normally read that? Suddenly, it's, it's a sought-after journal. I've been looking at it. Uh, there's over a hundred articles in it that are relevant that I've got to wade through. Um, and I, I, a little bit of empathy for scientists here, unless your name is Newton or somebody. Your life's work is dismissed in one reference in somebody's paper. Now, you've got to realise that. So science is huge. As far as I'm able to tell at the moment, scientists are not agreed on the question of whether aerosols are directional. There is some evidence and a degree of common sense that they probably are, you know, if there is an air stream coming from a body of singers, it's probably going to move away from their mouths. Does that mean that the row behind is going to affect the row in front, but the row in front is not going to affect the row behind? Um, that can only be answered as an element of risk. It can't be answered for certain. So aerosol scientists at the moment are looking at the behavior of these particles in enclosed spaces. And there was one paper I reviewed, um, the Association of Heating and Ventilating Engineers of the United States or something. Um, they, they've produced a load of stuff about um, how you circulate the air in a department store. I mean, there are just loads and loads of people working on this. And all I can say is the conclusion at the moment is that there will be some directionality to it, but you cannot say for certain 
that people downwind are at risk and people upwind are not. That I think would be the honest position. Martin, um, could you tell us where we might be able to find these articles? Are they online? Are they in print? Where might people go? And could you oh. put that on the chat? Um, maybe put it in the chat uh, if you have. I, I will, Amy. But since you've asked the question, um, <clears throat> and I don't want to insult people's intelligence here, and, and, and some people participating will know how all of this works, but any scientific paper that is published will have a long reference list. And I used to say this actually to my students who, I know to be fair, they couldn't understand this reference. Um, if you reference a paper and it's a peer reviewed scientific paper, the person who wrote that paper will have referenced 50 other people. And each of those will have referenced 50 other people. Um, so there's a massive exponential snowball, if you like. If you look at somebody who has done a literature review, as I have, I will have a bibliography and you can look at my bibliography and you can see, oh, those are the papers he's read. You can look at somebody else who's done a literature review and you'll see that some of the papers they cited are the same and some of them aren't. Um, I'm hoping that my article is going to be available this week. We're discussing that on Monday. When it comes out, it will have the bibliography. And you say you can say, well, Martin said this about aerosols. Uh, what journals has he cited? Here they are in the bibliography. Does that answer the question? Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Martin. Um, I wanted to come to Esmeralda now um, because I know she's doing this uh, uh, a fascinating piece of, uh, of work at the moment. Um, do you want to tell us about a little bit about that, Esmeralda? Yeah, um, so I'm currently uh, developing with my ensemble a piece that I've called Cabin Fever. And it's basically based on uh, um, dreams, strange dreams that are found on people sharing on Twitter. And um, the piece itself is written for zoom so for not muted microphones and it's written for community choirs with no um technology knowledge or no microphones um and the whole idea for me was okay um you can't beat the system so be part of it so as a composer i found that very interesting because i come from you know I, I collaborate a lot with contemporary artists and sound installations. So for me, creating something um, more about the sound than about the, let's say, four part harmonies, I find that very interesting. So um, I had um, the chance to de develop that piece with them um, rather than just sitting down and writing it. So every week I could test new things and they were my guinea pigs and they were all willing and happy to do it so i i really must thank them for the development and um i warned them i said look we i don't want to sing something that's written for a room because it won't sound like it and we'll never be able because we're not in that room we have to create something that works in this virtual room and they actually requested but we want to hear each other so that's how the whole idea came up. Okay, then let's open the microphone. And then I tried all sorts of things at the beginning, but slowly realized, okay, some things work, some don't. And I just compromised my ideas and my, my composition around what actually works. And the beauty in it was, it, to me, it's, it's a very contemporary music sounding piece. Uh, lots of landscapes, I would say, sound landscapes. But community was so um, open to, to sing something that modern, you know. And um, if I would have been in a room and showed them, this is the score, this is what we're going to do, they might not have been that uh, excited about it. But this, this um, cabin fever piece, they are very, um, yeah, they, maybe because they've been part, partly developing with me, but it also means something to them. So I somehow managed to create a connection with these sounds and them. And um, 
the idea of the piece is that we're not only singing, but we're also working with visuals, because I think that's something that Zoom brings in. Suddenly you see people, suddenly you see a room. And we've tried all sorts of things. And um, um, I've collaborated now with a designer that has uh, designed something. So we're actually covering up the screen so you won't see the singers and you'll see um, visuals. It's like a like a silent movie, sort of, uh, but there's sounds and singing. So it's, it's, it's hard to describe. And the whole idea is that we develop it a little bit further, that there will be a score, that there will be a pack with the visuals. And um, there will be an invite to all choirs worldwide to take part. Because we want, I want to hand over the baton to others and be like, uh, my, my ensemble, they asked me, can we please perform it? And I was like, oh gosh, how do, how do we perform something online? But it is possible with, with creating an atmosphere of a stage, with creating an atmosphere of, okay, I need to put a costume on, I need to get into performance uh, feeling, rather than I'm sitting at home and singing. It really does something. Every week I'm amazed how far we get and it's it's really interesting so the whole idea is that then at some point we can do a performance and maybe london starts and then they slowly disappear then japan starts uh, they slowly it's, disappear it's and really so interesting on. isn't it i think I've, I'm certainly aware uh, i'm guilty i should even say of um <laughs> of doing that thing of uh you know i'm finishing my dinner and i'm i'm washing up uh, two minutes before the rehearsal starts and then you know i quickly put on my shirt a smarter shirt and, and i'm there and hi everybody uh, and it's very interesting. You talk about kind of setting the the scene. I mean, in this case, for a performance, uh, because we we've, we've lost so much in terms of the the kind of trappings of a of a performance, haven't we? We 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 we're not we're not in the frame of mind unless unless we do something to create that frame of mind. Absolutely. I think the big mistake we are currently making is that we are trying to do exactly what we used to do in a room together online, and that doesn't work. Universities have fantastic um, materials, advice um, for teachers how to do a session online. But in the choral world, we seem to not have that yet because we were not used to that. And um, the advice I took out of that, it was very different. You need to structure it very differently. Even the warm ups, you know, people are constantly online, their necks are so <laughs> stretched and you know they're constantly looking you need to encourage them to not look to get back into their body and that's sort of our job as well not only choosing the right music and finding music but also really taking care of them and and in this whole setting and, and um, what I've experienced not only from our set that we get tired performing monologuing but their side also suddenly the laptop is work and mm -hmm. let's say fun and that's really hard. And then also the, the other question is always, um, what do you do with, with people who don't uh, have a laptop or who don't um, engage in technology? And it's, you know, th there's a huge lack of, of, of that too. So I'm currently writing a piece that works without laptops <laughs> and everything. So mm. I'm, I'm, for me, you know, same there. For me, I always like, uh, innovative projects are always like sort of trying to find the mold so by that I'm not saying you know every conductor needs to find now a piece that you know rewrite things or whatever you know it's it's in my practice and my con contemporary writing practice that's what I always do so for me this is exciting and interesting for others this might be completely overwhelming and hor hor horrendous you know so my advice then would be look what your choir is good at and what why do they meet on Monday evenings what what do they want from you and sort of emphasize that more and I, think, um, I, mean, you, I know you, you you touched on this you work very closely with the with the singers as you say you're you're effectively evolving the piece while you go with with the singers there you're you're innovating in in the rehearsals uh, and I think it's yeah. it's going to prove really important that um, you know nobody has a simple answer to any of this. There isn't a simple answer. There's going to be complicated answers to all of this, though. 
and um, as things evolve, different people are going to come up with different ideas at, uh, as, as we go and different technologies become available, different um, ways of, of conceiving the performance become, become available. So I think the schemes where uh, the, the composers that are going to succeed at this uh, are, are the ones that are willing to work with choirs and work with other people and get involved in 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 the there's a making music adopt a composer scheme for example and and uh, we're with my choir we're just beginning to talk about whether we we do that um and it's and that's it's a collaboration isn't it it must be because mm. um we are in a different space not only physically but emotionally as well so you know we we usually when we are in a room we can read the room we can control the room we can control the energy online it's very different so it needs to be some sort of collaborative it cannot just be monologuing and then hoping for the best um also musically obviously there are challenges when you leave the microphone open and all these things but actually speaking to my singers they enjoyed it they loved hearing someone else even if you're two seconds late um mm. they rather had that than not hearing them they felt much more connected and by doing that we had the chance to open it up to to singers that are in germany that singers are in in god knows all over the world and we would normally not have that opportunity so suddenly there is a way of including others and doing these these pieces um but yeah it, it might not be for everyone that's the other thing yeah. you know if 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 you're already overwhelmed with Zoom, then maybe having the microphone close that might give you the, the safe spot. For me, I for me it was just wonderful to to explore. I don't have any control about the microphones and what Zoom does, and I love it. So my piece is sort of not fully improvised, but there's part they are improvised. You know, we all love Immortal Bach, so it's like, it's not like that because you can't do that many harmonies, but it is, you have, every singer has a, has a chance to choose when to do something, but then there's also Zoom, Zoom chooses as well, who is louder, and on every day it's different, so to me, I love that, I find it very beautiful and I find it, it's alive, you know, rather than recorded, staged, it's alive, and it's really like a live feeling every time we try or rehearse it to, to be able to perform that something else happens and that's the beauty it doesn't need to be perfect but it it is alive fantastic but ben can i ask how many of your composers are seeing this as a, a golden opportunity do you do you think some of uh, other composers are are sort of alive to the possibilities how many or how many are feeling really hemmed in and and stifled do you think um, I've not spoken to all of them, but the ones the ones that I have, I think, really quite mixed reactions. I mean, I think, as, as I said at the beginning, some are quite enjoying the time, the sort of enforced lockdown of having some kind of writing time. Um, but I think others are definitely finding that difficult. And of course, you know, of course, as well as the kind of impact on on their writing, there's also the issue and the kind of financial impact, which is quick. Um, so the, the kind of those that, that run workshops and present as part of their part of their portfolio careers are challenged at the moment um uh but also you know uh, commissions are now drying up there are not those, those third party commissions from or commissions from choirs and from other um funding bodies are drying up as well and that in turn will impact music that's available in the future so that's a kind of very real challenge for us um looking looking kind of a little bit further ahead yeah. It's it's going to be really important. I think that there's a, a sort of general dialogue about this that that we composers and he does and we need composers. We're not going to be able to do. I mean, looking ahead to performances, even as things, um, even as restrictions lessen, uh, we're going to need pieces which work in those conditions. Uh, maybe you know we need a piece that can be partially recorded in advance and 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 synchronized with live or something or. We're going to have to try and um, arrange existing pieces. I was really interested how so many choirs seem to leap on the the passions as a as a vehicle for their virtual choirs, and the fact is there's a there's a sort of um, thread about the, the the particularly the John Passion where the involvement of the of the the chorales, the involvement of the the um, uh, congregation originally would have been, wouldn't it? That uh, that's a kind of metaphor for what's going on at the moment. We're all distributed. We're all contributing more remotely to to what's still a, a, a musical performance 
And I think we are going to discover ways of, of, of doing this. We're going to discover ways of bringing in these elements into, into performance. But that's not going to happen unless we're talking to composers, they're talking to choirs and working closely with them to, and, and, and also technology people. Um, th there's been a couple more questions about uh, on the technical side. I think somebody was asking about how we how we look after voices, which we did kind of cover the other the other day. But then also how we how we kind of balance. Uh, this is one of the big issues with with Zoom and the like is that the the sound level you get uh, is largely governed by the uh, how close somebody is sat to the microphone, isn't it? Uh, or in my case, how their sophisticated, complicated setup um, has changed since the last meeting. Um, I'm forever moving my um, equipment around and swapping laptops. Um, so uh, certainly what I'll try and do is collate a list of technology um, after this uh, after this presentation. I'll try and collate some lists because there are other options which give different capabilities and different um, challenges. Um, I wanted to talk um, just before. Amy, are there any, any any other questions that I've missed before I move on? No, I don't think so. Uh, just to say that um, it's really wonderful to see people engaging in the chat and, and sharing thoughts and opinions. Um, and some of the conversation is about actually strengthening pitching skills and improving musicianship and musical self-reliance. Um, so that's been quite interesting. And once again, the I think it's called the Sight Singing School, that website um, address has been shared. Sight Singing, yes, sightsingingschool.com. Um, I know there are many out there, and I also know of other MDs who are doing their own thing um, and uh, teaching musicianship in their own way. So that's been very, very interesting as well. I must say we're up to, uh, we were up a moment ago up to 32 people on YouTube and 87 in the room. This is this is quite a record for us so far isn't it amy we are we're well ahead of the maximum attendance so far so that's brilliant to see so many people engaging and yeah. i think it really is a testament to how how passionate we all are to to find these solutions sorry amy uh, you were going to say there is a question on youtube um from robin norman saying do you have any thoughts on conducting rehearsals with masks to help prevent the spread of aerosols i mean that's just so difficult isn't it mm -hmm. so i don't know if martin Martin looks like he might want to jump in. Um, <laughs> his head is in his hands. <laughs> visors. I mean, you can't you can't really sing with a mask on your face, but uh, visors might be slightly different. But um, just sharing that from YouTube. I was hoping this wouldn't come up. <laughs> um, <laughs> the the science on that really is split down the middle. Um, <clears throat> now I do hope you know my paper will be more widely available next week. Um, one of the interesting things is how much longer people have been wearing masks in Asian countries than they have in European countries. And long before COVID, you, you, you would see Asian people on the London Tube with masks on and you'd think, hmm, you know, um, it is a cultural thing, actually. In terms of the efficacy of it, um, <clears throat> There, is, there just isn't a consensus at the moment. Uh, I mean, the issue if you had a mask on during a 40, 60 minute choir rehearsal, it's going to get absolutely full of your own. Um, it's not going to be very nice to wear it. And visors are going to be cumbersome. Um, there isn't a very clear scientific consensus that you're doing that much good. but as I say, the work is being done on this while we speak, and that could be different in a week's time. It's worth making that point, actually. This is such a fast moving field that what is said today needs to be updated in a week's time. Um, so yes, and no to masks, I'm afraid. Yeah. And just in the last um, few minutes, I wanted to just briefly touch on one issue that I think is is often left aside. We're concerned about our rehearsals, and then we, we may be thinking about performances at some point in the future. Uh, what we what I haven't seen a lot of discussion about online is is audiences, um, except to to say that I, I think many of us probably know that the proms uh, published their uh, their performance schedule uh, or their uh, 
uh, what's the word um potential performance schedule uh and i've heard predictions that they are going to be limited to about 20 percent capacity for the audience if if anything um i think this is an issue that we're all going to have to face and actually i'm not sure if any of us will be able to provide any very concrete answers but we're going to have to find ways of connecting with audiences which is which go beyond just getting people to turn up to a concert and sit in a concert hall and pay their um 12 pounds at 50 or whatever it may be to to sit and listen for two and a half hours um, can i come in there mark of course yeah uh, the, the choir I mentioned in Stockholm uh, is an interesting illustration of that. They found that their live performing venues have stopped. There may be um, <clears throat> economic reasons for that, uh, which people are going to have to face, that if you can only 20% fill a large hall, you're not going to pay the overheads of that hall. Now, the choir in Stockholm, um, it's, a, it's a boys' choir, so the kids have got to be kept interested. They've got to be kept rehearsing. They are practising to give streaming performances. And I, I think it would be very wise to follow that example and to think, how can you cultivate your online audience? And I was actually at the RSCM uh, webinar a week ago, and some of the thinking there was very very go ahead about when all of this is over you know it's both and there will be a new on stream you know audience if that's the right word but church services it, it's both and so start looking at it now rehearse towards it yeah ben's making the point of putting performances online and and having a donate button uh, on the same page uh, once again, I think that a lot of this is led with technology. There are um, th there are more ways than Zoom to to broadcast, uh, and you you start researching now to find the software that that supports your particular charging model. But you also need to have that conversation with with committees and singers about how we get into that model. How we uh, whether we have a subscription model, whether we just try and make money from individual uh, watches. Um, and we all know from uh, Spotify that uh, performers don't get very much for that. Um, Esmeralda, have you ha have you had any thoughts along those lines? How are you monetizing your your work at the moment? Any plans? Um, in terms of online performances, yeah, it's a tricky one. I think, especially because um, suddenly, as a choir, if you do something online, you're not only competing with let's say the symphony orchestra was doing the same night something, but you're also competing with um, San Francisco's uh, contemporary art museum, you know, suddenly it's a very different thing. So you need to be very um, aware of what you want to put out and when and how, what, what is the point, you know, is it, is it, yeah, is it, there, there should be a lot of thinking about why you want to perform and how and, um, yeah, it's hard to put in in, in, a, in a short mm. sentence, but it's it's also the audiences themselves, they're very overwhelmed, you know, they don't know where to go, they don't know where to look. So obviously, it's a bit like choral concerts, like mouth to mouth. So yeah, that yeah, works, and in but... one sense, this is something that we've we've all been addressing or, uh, you know, forward looking um, arts organisations have had to address this for a long time, how you generate an online audience. Um, uh, but maybe that's maybe that's something that ABCD could do, like just mm. have a schedule of choral performances, and then people at least know that's where you go and look. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's just overwhelming, also for audiences. I must say, there's a lot of research going on online audiences and how to, you know, everyone's trying to survive. Museums as well, and everyone's just trying to find a way of still engage with their audiences, but also um, not overwhelm them with so much visual content so yeah in many ways this isn't a new problem is it uh, people have got to realize that musicians have got to be paid that you know um and perhaps there's been too much streaming music and posting things on youtube and now it's the day of reckoning so mo monetizing button um it's a cultural shift I'm uh, aware of the time. I just want to um, give the rest of the panel a chance to 
to deliver their closing statements. No, I, I'm building that up. But you know, uh, guys, uh, Ben, Daniel, anything that we've we've covered on that you've been itching to mention? Uh, not from my point of view, I think, Mark. I think it's been fascinating discussion, and, and you know, as a choir director myself, invaluable information. So I'm very grateful to the other panelists for sharing their expertise. Thanks, Daniel. Well, nothing, sorry, I'm saying nothing, nothing to add, particularly for me, but just to just to reinforce the point I made earlier. Um, you know, we as publishers are, are here to kind of serve serve the market, and um, so as as kind of things evolve in this space, um, do do talk to us and, and tell us things that we're not doing that you need because uh, we're, we're really open to suggestions on that front. Can I then say thank you to all the panel? I don't think we've got time for any more questions, I'm afraid, but um, I want to, uh, I've been hoping to, to get this uh, particular session going for a little while. And um, as Ben says, I, my feeling is particularly that we need to start talking to each other far more. We need to bring all of the different sort of streams of, of people involved in the arts and in, in music and in choral singing together to share ideas and discover what's possible. Um, so I'd like to say a huge thank you to Martin, Martin Esmeralda, Daniel and Ben uh, for their time this morning. Can we give them a virtual round of applause? I'd like to thank Amy for um, her support uh, on the day and long before, and thank you to ABCD for facilitating these uh, discussions. They will go on. Uh, we are busy with a schedule for June at the moment. Amy, do you want to say something about June? Yes, I uh, just wanted to say something about next week, actually. So the 6th of June, still a Saturday, 11 till 12.30. Um, we are presenting a webinar called Inside the LSC, London Symphony Chorus. So Simon Halsey and his team will be talking uh, and discussing the LSO Discovery family of choirs, uh, their world-class performances um, and their extensive community and education programmes. No doubt uh, the lockdown um, will obviously feature in this discussion as well and we will see how they're coping with that too. So hopefully you can all join us next week as well. Um, we talked about donate buttons. Um, if you would like to donate to ABCD, if you are in a financial position to do so, we would welcome that so very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in this morning. It's been great to see everyone and to read all the chat. And thank you to the panel uh, on behalf of myself and ABCD as well. Thank you, Mark, for chairing it. It's been a wonderful morning. Thank you, Amy. Um, we will be um, sharing the video. Uh, the video will be available for another week. Uh, we will publish the chat to uh, attendees and people who've signed up to the, the um, webinar list. Um, somebody's asking me when I'll publish my list of ideas. Um, I always seem to come to these and make some kind of promise and then um, rediscover that I haven't got time to fulfill them. I have actually got a presentation kind of sorted out. I will try and extend that and get it uh, within the next few days. Uh, I promise. I pinky swear. Um, right, on that note, thank you to everybody. It's been a fantastic attendance. It's been a fantastic morning. Thank you once again to our panel and we'll see you all very soon.